So was the president premature in declaring the pandemic over? I know it's wishful thinking on a lot of our parts. Joining me now is Dr. Corey Hebert. He is a member of the LSU Medical School and host of some other titles as well. Dr. Hebert, uh, thank you for giving us some time this morning. Let's start with the president. Was he right in saying the pandemic is over at this point, uh, three years in? Well, over is relative, right? Uh, let, let's be clear. He did say that we still have COVID to deal with. And the president, uh, by and large, cannot declare a, a pandemic over. I mean, you know, it, we talk about things like eradication. Those are uh, terms that we talk about with the World Health Organization. And although the, the World Health Organization came out the other day to say that our numbers of death of COVID-19 are lower, as low as uh, March in 2020, which is a great thing, but there are about 25,000 people in the United States right now that would beg to differ uh, that the pandemic is over. Um, it, because they're in the hospital right now fighting for their lives. You always have to remember, as a doctor, I don't think that the pandemic is over because I'm still dealing with patients with long COVID. I'm still dealing with patients that actually get COVID every day. And remember, if you get it, and it's 100% in your house and 100% not over. So you have to get treated immediately. There are lots of oral medica medications out there that you need to take immediately if you get this disease because it is still a killer. And like, like I mentioned earlier, eradication, I mean, that's not going to happen. We had smallpox that was um, eradicated by definition and render pest virus that was eradicated. Most of you have never even heard of render pest virus. There's only two diseases ever been eradicated. So will it ever be over, over? No. But will it be over enough where you can go on with your life? Yes. And I think that's what the president meant. Right. So, I mean, early on, we heard the term pandemic versus endemic, and we knew that COVID was never going to be something we'd be rid of. So at what point do we move into that endemic phase where it's more like the flu? Every year, we're lining up for a flu vaccine. We're preparing in the fall and winter months to get it. Have we shifted to that point yet? And what will that take? We're very close. And what endemic means is that when you have outbreaks in certain parts of the world and certain um, yeah, moments in time. That's really what that means. It doesn't disrupt the entire world. Pan means obviously global, right? And, and all inclusive. Endemic means in that particular area. So I think we're moving there. And I really don't think that we're going to be having to take the, a COVID-19 vaccine for many years. Just like remember they had the H1N1 virus vaccine that we had to take for the flu. And then all of a sudden it was kind of not there. And then we just have to take the regular flu vaccine. Um, that's what this is going to be. Because remember, coronavirus is not a very complex virus. It's a virus that nobody had been exposed to of SARS-CoV-2. We had been exposed to coronavirus, but not actually SARS-CoV-2. So that's why everyone has to get their uh, their immunizations, but everyone has to build up this tolerance. That's what we talked about, herd immunity, flattening that curve. Everyone has to get their antibodies and natural antibodies and antibodies that were injected into you and antibodies that were made because you got the vaccine. Once we get to that point, we won't need to get this vaccine anymore. But until then, treatment very quickly quickly, make sure that if you have these symptoms, you know, it can spread very quickly in a household. So just be careful out there. I'm glad you brought brought that up, uh, vaccination rates, because Axios is reporting a low rate of vaccination rates among kids, about 325,000 kids fully vaccinated against COVID-19. From the start of the pandemic, we heard kids are less susceptible to get it. If they get it, they won't get as sick as many adults, especially immunocompromised. So what is your messaging on kids? Should they be getting the vaccine, especially the younger ones who seem to be able um, to resiliently overcome it more than the rest of us. Yeah, that's a double-edged sword. I mean, children are much more resilient than adults. Remember, we use kids almost as pin cushions. We give them four and five shots at a time when they're two months, four months, six months. They're very resilient to, with, with vaccinations to make antibodies very quickly, but they're also very resilient when it comes to getting a disease. Um, I uh, take care of children as well, so I am giving the vaccine to my patients because you know, we expect people that are much older to eventually die. But if you have one child that dies because of a preventable illness, it stings. And that's why I am vaccinating my, my children uh, that I take care of with this. And I, I encourage others to do so as well. But that's a decision you do have to make uh, at your home and, and look at the folks that are um, immunocompromised in your home, because those are the people that those children are going to bring uh, that illness to. And that could be devastating. So it, it, it's a hard one. But children bounce back. Adults tend not to.
I want to get your reaction to some breaking news, doctor, that we just got into the newsroom out of New York. Mayor Eric Adams says that he's lifting the COVID vaccine mandate for private sector employees. That starts um, in just a month or so from now on November 1st. What do you have to say about lifting the restrictions at this point in the pandemic um, when we're going back to work? Um, I think that's a bad idea. I think, doctor, uh, I mean, well, uh, uh, Mr. Adams is making a bad decision there because every time, if you go back, every time in this pandemic, when people lift these sanctions and lift these restrictions, we have increased numbers. I mean, it happened during 4th of July, it happened during Thanksgiving, and I would be on the news talking about this every day, and then those numbers just bump back up. Whereas there's really no reason to be preemptively doing and lifting vaccine mandates because what's the harm right now in keeping the vaccine mandate? There is no harm. We have to stay with the science. Science is the key. You know, public health is a four-legged stool. You have money, you have politics, you have science, and you have public outcry. Public outcry should not be the thing that drives us. Science should always be it, not, not public outcry, not politics, and not money. And speaking of following the science, I've often wondered this throughout the pandemic. I mean, it sort of just, it came out of nowhere, right? It killed so many people. It changed our lives really forever. It set our children back in the education sector. Um, pull back the curtain a little bit about what the science is telling us. One, about how this virus potentially could continue to mutate, but what else is out there and what's happening at the CDC, what's happening at the WHO right now to prepare us for next time, given what we've learned these last few years? Well, I think we were pretty transparent with the CDC uh, this past year when we said that, you know, there were some missteps. And, you know, it's a, when you claim a mea culpa, that's a really good way to say, look, we want more funding. We want more doctors that are going to be involved in research. Uh, we want to be able to stockpile a lot of uh, the PPE, which we didn't have after the last administration. Um, things were disbanded. So, you know, I think it's really important that we make sure that, you know, we understand the history so we're not doomed to repeat. And we're out there fighting right now so that we can get the, the leadership and the funding uh, and the organizational structure at the highest levels, nationally and internationally, so that we will be able to fight the next one. Because I'm very concerned about polio in the United States, very concerned. I'm very concerned about Marburg virus in uh, in Ghana, which kills people as well. And, and so these things are all, we're just one plane ride, one plane ride from someone coming to the United States with something that we don't know about, and we're right back where we started. I mean, not to mention things like monkeypox. So at this point, we have to continually, continuously wash up. You know, I say mask up, separate, and vaccinate. And those are the things that got us through this. Not we just wanted to do this, and that's one thing I always mention with anti-vaccine folks. We didn't just wish polio away. We didn't do that. We vaccinated our way out of it. We didn't just wish uh, tetanus away. We didn't wish the scourge of illness away. It goes away because of our organizational structure and how our public health systems support the United States of America. And that's what I do every day. And that's what my colleagues do as well. Yeah, I think if we've learned anything, we've learned how fragile our healthcare system can be when a pandemic like this strikes and we cannot let our guard down. Um, and, and we'll see if there are ramifications with this breaking news out of New York, the mayor lifting those COVID COVID restrictions, as you say, not a good idea this morning. Dr. Iber, thank you uh, for your expertise. Good to see you. Thank you.